No, we're not talking about a Scandinavian Star Trek spin-off, but we are talking about Swedenborg, coming up on Tognosis. That's Emanuel Swedenborg, for those of you who are interested. And uh, to help me with this interview is my co-host, Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Toby. What are you laughing about? <laughs> no, I just I wasn't expecting that intro. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad. I didn't. I didn't hear an audible groan from our from our guest. So I guess that's a good sign. <laughs> and speaking of our guest, who might also who might be audibly groaning and have might just shut his microphone off. We don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> we have Curtis Childs from the uh, Swedenborg Foundation and uh, also runs a YouTube channel and does some podcasts and stuff like that. Welcome, Curtis, and thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I, I fully endorse that opening. Um, <laughs> I, I've gotten quite a number of Borg jokes online, too, so, so that's, I take that in stride. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, well, so I think a lot of our viewers will probably have some inkling of who Emanuel Swedenborg was and, and what he did, but uh, let's just do a quick recap. Can you tell us about Emanuel Swedenborg and sure. his legacy? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, m most of his life, the first half of his life, Swedenborg was a scientist. I mean, well, once he got old enough to get into the field, he uh, was actually really good at it. You know, he was ahead of his field in a lot of different areas. They call that polymath sometimes. But he was doing things as diverse as, like, uh, being on the cutting edge of anatomy, but also uh, helping the Swedish government with their mining industry. He had this project once where he had to get a bunch of ships across land from one sea to another, and it affected the outcome of a war. So he was doing all kinds of things, and that was what he was, and that was what he was going to become known for except something happened in his mid-50s where he, his life took this radically different track and it came about through what started as a series of, of vivid dreams which then kind of started to turn into more than dreams and then became these overt mystical or spiritual experiences that then became this, uh, this perennial feature of his life and that, that he stopped publishing scientifically, he started to write these what people call his theological works and that's what he spent the rest of his life doing, and he did that at a, a torrid pace. He wrote, you know, millions of Latin words, all describing what he'd seen through his experiences and what he'd learned through his studies of the Bible and those experiences in tandem. And that, that you know, as you would expect, kind of wrecked his career. Uh, <laughs> people didn't want to, the scientific community wasn't, wasn't too keen on that, so he kind of fell into obscurity. Um, what, I think if he had continued being a scientist, he would be much better known now than he is because he was making some discoveries that, that even today stand up. So uh, he had this, but he felt like this is what I've got to do. This all He actually looked back on his scientific career and said, all that was just leading up to this this new spiritual mission that I have. So that that's him, and uh, the Swedenborg Foundation is just taking those books and ideas and saying, wait, we the world should have this in the conversation, a little more of Swedenborg in the conversation, because there, there might be something there of value. So that, that's, that's a very, very quick version of, of who is Swedenborg. Mm -hmm. What about his uh, mystical experiences? What, what, what forms did these take? What did he uh, learn? And yeah, they, I would say all forms. I mean, he, it wasn't like um, he had, so you'll get people now who, who write a book, they had like a near-death experience where uh, they were close. They were in some kind of physical danger. They had this this one really intense experience, and then that then they're reflecting on that. He was having experiences daily and, and actually perpetually. Like he he it never shut off. There was one time right in the beginning of, of his spiritual phase when he went like a month without any, and he thought, well, was that all a dream? But then they came back. He he was having all kinds of experiences, and I'll try to detail the basic type. So there was what people would now call out-of-body experiences, mm -hmm. where he would you know, say, I, I came into my spirit, and he would go and travel, be able to travel into these spiritual realms. You know, He visited the places that he called heaven, that he called hell, and the world of spirits. He got to see uh, you know, angels and evil spirits and, and tour that world and tour it um, lucidly. He could choose where he wanted to go and, and would ask questions and get shown things but also continually, like he, he had a three decades of experience daily, you know, that, that, that went on and on. And 
all painted this cohesive worldview that he was so he still had his his scientific roots so he was meticulously documenting everything that he found and ordering and not just reporting on phenomena like i saw this there was this but but really showing what he had learned about the root causes of everything why is the whole universe the physical and spiritual worlds organized in the way it is what forces are driving things what forces drive human experience all that so he would have out of body experiences he would also be able to hear spirits in his daily life he could hear voices so he would be doing something writing something um even walking down the street near stores and he would hear commentary from from spirits on on the things that were going on around him on the people he was with uh, and he would also have, he described there was a couple of rare rare kinds of experiences he would have where he says that he, he, he related it to passages in the Bible about being taken out of the body. He said that he could be in conversation with spirits and angels out, you know, in this spiritual world while his, his physical body, this is really out there stuff, but while his physical body was still walking around from place to place doing, and he would come back into his body and say, Oh, how did I get here? Like, I'm all the way on the other side of town. Um, that was very rare. That wasn't his normal uh, mode of doing things. So he, he had, and, and his, his experiences were, were all, all the senses, you know, he could smell things, he could see things, he could hear, hear things, touch, taste. Um, and, and also uh, a lot of them did sort of move into this transcendent experience that he struggled to, to describe. A lot of it he could describe in detail, but there's, there's also a lot of times when he says, you know, like you get with, with, people, with all kinds of people who have these experiences, like this earthly words don't do this justice. Um, he even remarked, when he wrote once that he was showing some, some angels that he had talked to what he was writing, and they were like, well, I mean, that doesn't really, that doesn't really get it, but he's like, well, that's the best I can do mm. with the words that I have. So there's all of the above Swedenborg had any kind of experience you know, from the very um, comforting and beautiful to the to the very frightening and dark to the just weird. He he had all of that, or, or that according to what he wrote down, you know, mm -hmm. all of his books, as well as we don't just have his published works, but we have his journals of his experiences that he would just keep kind of the raw data day to day. So so he was saying he was having all these if. If he was just making it up, then he was making it up in private as well, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I can't be sure about it. But according to him, this is what he went through. And he's still working in a uh, Christian framework, right? Like he's he's getting deeper insight into his, his Christian faith and, as you said, into uh, the Bible and into experiences that he saw in the Bible. Yes, absolutely. If you, if you open Swedenborg pretty much anywhere— Divine, his, he has a book, Divine Love and Wisdom, where there's a few less, but you'll see Bible references everywhere. In fact, his entire entire uh, first few years of these experiences was going through the first Genesis and Exodus and chronicling what he thought felt like was the, the inner layers of meaning on that text. And he a lot of his work is Bible-centric. He also... He places utmost importance on Jesus Christ. He has all these Christian things in there, but then he also has visiting spirits, um, seeing like the outflowing um, aura of them, all these things that would almost sound more New Age. He's kind of an interesting intersection of flavors, which is, I think, a reason why it's so hard for people to get into him because if you're coming from a Christian perspective, you're like, oh, I like that, but what, where's he going here? If you're coming from a non-Christian perspective, you're, oh, I like that, but why is there all this Christian stuff in here? So he was, you could certainly classify him as Christian mystic, that would be fair. Mm -hmm. um, but but he, he um, there's some interesting differences. It was in enough differences that did he got in in trouble with the the Protestant Church of his day, which was there was a, you know a theocracy in Europe at the time, mm -hmm. um, because because he was saying things that, that weren't doc uh, weren't within the the doctrine of the time, but but yeah, he, you're, there's Christian uh, terminology everywhere there. He talks about salvation, as I said, talks about Jesus and the Bible. He talks about heaven and hell. So yeah, very much this was yeah he he, he I think he saw himself as a Christian reformer. Um, and and you're not going to go anywhere in Swedenborg without encountering all kinds of Christian Christian material.
Mm. So what uh, what became of all of these revelations? To, uh, you know what. Uh, uh, some some groups were formed out of uh, out of these experiences. Yeah, uh, I mean, close to nothing actually came out of them. I mean, he he sold very. I mean, he he wasn't selling his books for profit. He would give them to the publishers, and he's actually initially publishing them anonymously. Hmm. Uh, he 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 would just publish them. Uh, he wouldn't put his name on them. It was only after actually some other people began to deduce who he was that he be, he put in his later books he would put his name on it. But but his books were not were not bestsellers. They were not hits. Um, he I, he wrote in a letter once like, oh yeah, I sold like two books this month. You know, um, <laughs> that's like my book. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So we we can all relate to that. Yeah. Um, but that didn't deter him from his. From his quest at all, he he felt like the important thing is to get these out, and hopefully he was trying to push them. He was sending copies to the universities in Europe at the time and to the the leadership in the church because mm -hmm. he thought people in the church are going to find this and they're going to they're going to love it and they're going to say yes, this is this is how we can expand our understanding of our faith. This is where we can correct where we've gone off track. This th he thought they would love it, you know, or, or they didn't. I mean, <laughs> a few did uh, a lot. He got very, very heavily mixed reaction, and I think you still see that with him today. All the way from um, this, this completely turned my life around, and and now this, this is the your writings are now the lens through which I see life. All the way around to like people wanted to have him tried and killed, and you know, <laughs> so it it was the whole thing. So in his lifetime, there there wasn't a huge impact. Um, he never started any kind of groups or or followings. He never had disciples. Um, he never started a church. There were there was societies of people after his death that um, that found his books, got really into him, and formed groups. Those have led to a few tiny churches uh, that, that are still extant today. But I think his the major impact from his work has actually been through lone individuals. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Helen Keller. Uh, was an avid Swedenborgian. She mm. wrote a couple of books about how, and actually, there's a, there's a whole fascinating story there about how her family was basically saying, like, don't bring Swedenborg into this. Like, <laughs> he's weird. What do you? Don't do that. You know, everybody likes you. What are you doing with? But she really wanted to tell everyone how much she likes Swedenborg. And there, there, there's um, there was a lot of Swedenborg's influence in the early abolitionist movement, um, mm. and uh, like the guy who designed the World Fair in Chicago. Was was basing some of that on Swedenborg, and a lot more people may know his influence on uh, poets and, and writers uh, in America and, and elsewhere. So I think his his greatest influence came through those those people, people that just found him. You do have churches. I think the people that are going to church at Swedenborg and churches, you know, you're talking about five thousand or less. Yeah. You know, um, and actually, actually, Swedenborg was a lot bigger. Uh, in, the, in the late 1800s, you know, uh, like 100 years after his death or, or after his life that, than he is now. I mean, you can look at old newspaper articles, and I remember seeing some review of somebody else's book, and the, uh, the author didn't like it, and he was like, oh, this smacks of Swedenborgianism. You know, every, people did know who he was back then, but, mm -hmm. but he's kind of been in a lull recently. Um, so we're trying to change that. We're trying to bring yeah. him back. It's like trying to make him cool again. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Um, I, we're out of time for our video portion right now, but uh, I've got a whole bunch of questions that I, w I can't wait to ask you uh, cool. in the podcast. So uh, so let's uh, let's stay tuned for that. Uh, we've got all your links uh, to the Swedenborg Foundation, to your YouTube channel. We'll drop those all down in the, in the description below. Uh, is there anywhere else you'd like to, to send people to find you on the internet? Or? No, that, that's plenty. Thanks. Okay. All right. No problem. So for those of you who are watching us along at home, we will see you next week. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.